Hello there. Today we're looking at language models as zero shot planners, extracting actionable knowledge for embodied agents. And I'm going to interview the first author, Wenlong Huang, in a few minutes. So first, there's an explanation of the paper, 10, 15 minutes or so. I'm gonna try to keep to it. And then we jump into the interview where we can discuss this paper at length. On a high level, this paper asks, can we use the knowledge that is inherent in large language models like GPT-3 or surprisingly OpenAI's codex in order to do planning in what they call embodied agents? Ultimately, it's going to be this environment right here, the uh, I don't even know what it's the virtual home environment. And it's about a virtual home, you have to fulfill some tasks, like brush your teeth, then the model has to come up with a sequence of steps that are admissible by the environment. So there's a level of admissibility of action, predefined actions that are admissible, the model has to come up with these actions in order to fulfill the task, the model is then rated based on executability and correctness of their plans. And it turns out that the larger the models get, as you can see right here, the less executable the plans become, which means that the actions they generate aren't admissible by the environment, probably because the models are more, let's say, powerful, they can express themselves in more ways, they have different ideas of how to reach goals. However, the correctness this is human evaluated of these models rise as they grow larger. So this gives you an indication that the large models seem to have quite a lot of knowledge. And we have to say these are not trained, the entire paper just works except for one baseline evaluation just works with pre trained models, they're not fine tuned at all on this environment right here. So what this paper does is it says, well, given that the larger the models get the more correct their plans are, can we do something to fix the issue with the executability? To that, they develop this translation procedure right here. These are three specific improvements they do to the models in order to get their executability up. You can see they sacrifice like a little bit of the correctness, but they do make the plans largely executable in the environment. And therefore, procedures like this could be applied in many different ways. It's not only about the virtual home environment and so on. It's essentially anywhere where you bring together the knowledge that is inherent in large language models with some some sort of a domain specific language or a grammar or any anything like this, like where you have to transfer that knowledge into a new domain, but you don't want to train a model to do so. So we're going to see how they do it really briefly. First of all, the environment itself, as I already said, is this now this is visualized, although they never work, you know, actually in 3d, <laughs> just a small correction here, because I messed this up. There are actually two versions of the virtual home environment. One is a Python version that focuses on the textual interaction with the environment. The other one is implemented in Unity and actually does work in 3D. The developers of the environment mostly focus on the Unity environment because it's more real. But as of yet, that has a subset of the actions available that the Python environment has. And the authors of the paper use the Python environment and the data set that comes along with that. We're going to go into this more in the interview stay tuned. They simply grab the data set of possible tasks, some tasks you can see right here, a task could be throw away paper, another task could be brush teeth, and there there'd be a sequence of steps. This environment is made by humans. So the tasks are made by humans, and then other humans have to come up with the steps that are admissible, admissible actions in this environment, there are I believe a number of objects that are defined, they're predefined. Yeah, so there are a number of objects, for example, living room, television, sofa, and so on. And there are a number of verbs. So walk, find, uh, switch on, and so on. And not every verb object combination is possible. Some verbs have two objects and so on. But essentially, you combine the predefined verbs and the predefined objects, and then the state of the world changes. So the word keeps track of states, there are certain preconditions, for example, you can probably only sit on the sofa if you are in the vicinity of it. So you need to first find the sofa, <laughs> you can only uh, switch on the television. Similarly, if you have first found the television or, or walked to the television or something like this, if the television is in the living room, you first need to go to the living room, and so on. So there's a, a hidden kind of a state. But all of this is constructed. And we talk about this in the interview, like, what's the appropriate granularity 
of actions like this. And isn't this a major issue, but it is made all with the humans in the loop. So the data set is supposed to be kind of the most natural expression of these tasks as uh, split into steps that a human would come up with. So this is the grammar of the environment. And the language models, they don't, they don't know about this grammar, they're just language models. So what they do is they take something like uh, GPT three, and they make a prompt. Now the prompt, as you might know, in GPT three, you have to give a prompt. So the prompt could just be like, here's the task, you know, blah, 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 brush your teeth, then what's step one, right? And then GPT three will probably it will probably even generate step two and three and four, but it will probably not be according to the these actions in these templates, you can help this a little bit by putting a prompt up here. So the prompt they use is one, I believe one specific plan. So they have already like task up here, some task and then some number of steps, so that the model kind of knows what is expected. We also talk about this in the interview, and this could potentially be improved um, by multiple, multiple prompts and so on. But in the baseline, they have one particular prompt. And then one of the improvements is actually to uh, select a more optimal prompt. But this is the basic setup, you have a goal in this environment with a fixed grammar, and you task you input this right here to your language model and the language model will spit out the plan. Now, what do you do with the plan? The plan, you score, like how good is the plan? And they have two different scorings available. One is executability. And executability is just like, it's essentially parsability by the environment. So in executability, you ask yourself, can it be correctly parsed, which means that is the syntax according to the syntax of the environment, and they do have a little translation procedure, like a little heuristic translation procedure for the baseline in place, uh, so that the language model probably can't get it exactly right. Uh, but they do sort of translate to the, the closest action there but also one of the improvements is related to this. And then also does it satisfy the common sense constraints of the environment, and these would be programmed in like, for example, you can only pour yourself a glass of milk if you first open the fridge and, and grab the milk, this can be measured directly, what cannot be measured that well is correctness. So these models, they would come up with plans and independent of whether they're executable or not, they could be correct, right? And that's where they ask humans. So they use human evaluations, they conduct human evaluations in order to score the correctness of whatever these models output. So they give it to a human, ask the human, does this look like a sensible plan in order to brush your teeth? And the human would either say yes or no, when they do like ablations and so on, they also use like longest common subsequences between two programs and so on in order to not spend ginormous amounts of money on humans. But essentially, the correctness metric is a human metric. It's also interesting, because you, you thought you could just execute like the plan in the environment, and that give you like, does it succeed or not, but they say correctly that for a task like make breakfast, there's not really a defined end condition that you could program into the environment to give a reward. So it's more accurate to ask humans whether a plan is correct. As you might have guessed, this environment is very human centric, it's made by humans uh, with humans in the loop and so on, it's supposed to really be sort of a representation of of human tasks and human plans to human tasks. All right. So now we're going into the improvements, there are three distinct improvements they make. So if they just do this, if they just do what we've described so far, then the graph up here results, uh, excluding the two models on the right, you can see the larger the models get, the higher their correctness, but the worse their executability. So now the thought is, can we change that? Can we raise the executability? And so this is the baseline right here, zero shot planning via causal large language model, you put in a task as a prompt. And along with like the format you expect, which is this one right here, which is some other task from the data set, then you use the pre trained language model like GPT three or something. And that will give you a plan. And that's it. So the next thing they do is they do what they call a translation model. So they introduce a second model, which is also pre trained. And this is it's not trained on translation, it's just trained on masked large language modeling. So think of this like, this is just BERT. In fact, I believe they use sentence BERT. 
uh, just pre-trained on English language. And what they do is they make a big vocabulary of all the admissible actions. So all the admissible actions would just be like any combination between any verb and any object that would actually go with that that is admissible to this verb. So from this, they make like a giant list of all of the admissible actions. And then they embed that giant list. So they put this into some embedding space using the sentence BERT model pre trained, right. And then whenever the large language model outputs something, they don't implement it into the plan directly, they first embed whatever the model outputs. Let's put this over here, they embed it, let's say that becomes this right here, then they see what's the nearest neighbor of my admissible actions to this thing. And then they simply replace whatever the model output with the nearest neighbor. And they call that they call that translation. So essentially, it translates from general natural language space into the space of the admissible actions or the grammar of the model. Now this has some problems on its own. For example, if the model outputs the compound actions. Uh, so if it says, for example, squeeze out a glob of lotion and put it in your mouth or so or or on your face, I guess, then, well, it's apply lotion, it's anywhere, squeeze out the glob of lotion and put it on your skin, that would be still one action. Now, which one would be the closest right here, there's going to be somewhere like, uh, squeeze out a bit of lotion, and the other one is going to be like, put the lotion on your skin, yet you only have one action, like it's, it's, it's one line. So one action, it just contains like an and now the end might be easy to recognize, but there are other, there are going to be other like compound actions. And this is going to be a problem here, because you just map one action to one admissible action. But in any case, doing this already helps a lot, even though there are still some problems to alleviate uh, the rest of the problems, they have two more improvements. The first improvement they do is they say, well, if there is a compound action, we can still kind of alleviate that a little bit. So in the original method, what they did is they simply took this through the through the language model, and they got out just a list of steps, right? Here is step one, here is step two, here is step three, and so on. That is just a list of steps. And they would translate even when they use the translation model, they would translate each of them to a admissible action, translate this one to an admissible action. Well, now you have no idea of whether that sequence of admissible actions even makes sense, right? For example, one could be a compound action, and it just gets translated to one of the two actions, and then the next action doesn't have a, a precondition. So what they do is they interleave the two steps, right? They interleave this translation with the generation. So they would only generate one step at a time, like step one, then they would translate it. And then they would use the translated version and put it back into the language model to get step two. That way, the language model always is conditioned on admissible actions instead of just being free form and then translating after the fact. So this is auto regressive generation. The last improvement they make, which is, I guess, more of a minor improvement, that's why it's not in this diagram. However, what they do is instead of having a generic prompt, what they do is they take the task, uh, they embed it using the same uh, sentence bird embedding, and they compare it to, um, to embeddings of all of the tasks that they have in the data set, and they just pick the closest task in the data set to act as a prompt, which could still transfer some in context knowledge in, you know, for the current task. So that is essentially the method, they investigate this, uh, they have a algorithm right here, they also like they, it's, I'm, I formulated it in an rather easy way, but they do not only consider the closest action, they consider actually a weighting of in the, so in the translation, they consider a weighting uh, between how close it is it to an admissible action, and how likely is that action uh, that they that they output. So they would generate not only one action and then translate it, they would actually generate a bunch of variants. And they consider each one of them like how close is it to an admissible action, and also how likely is it and then they take the best combination of the two that is obviously modulated by a hyperparameter. Um, 
they have early stopping and all of this kinds of stuff. And this results in this results in a neat uh, in a neat algorithm that and we're going to talk about these things in a bit and also the uh, also the results right here. I just I want to highlight that if you look at, for example, vanilla GPT-3 has a really low executability, it does have a high correctness. Um, however, if you look at the translated version, which is after their improvements, you can see the executability has risen dramatically, while the correctness is a bit lower, like you get a bit lower in correctness because of the whole translation procedure and so on, you're mocking with the outputs, humans may not like it as much. This is all stuff we're going to touch on in the interview. Just interestingly highlighting that codex, like the codex model seems to be scoring quite well on these tasks. So also the translated codex uh, is much smaller. However, it scores high, really high. So parameter for parameter, the codex model is actually pretty, pretty good at this, which was a surprise to me. So I think this is an exciting paper. It, it except as I said, for a fine tuning baseline, it turns out to work with completely without any training. It's just evaluation, so to say. And I liked it. And I think this does have applications like getting the knowledge out of these large language models is something uh, we should, you know, be getting better at doing. Otherwise, I don't think we make full use of them. All right, so now I want to jump into the interview with Wenlong. I hope you enjoy that as well. Tell me how you like these these videos with the interviews without the interviews, anything you want in the comments. I'll see you. Bye bye. Welcome, everyone. Uh, today with me here is Wenlong Huang, who is the first author of the paper about language models as zero shot planners and uh, very, very happy to have you here. Uh, welcome, Wenlong. Thank you, Yanning. Uh, yeah, super, super happy to be here. This is, I, I've already told you, but this paper is different and, and I like different papers. And um, it's it's different in a way that uh, maybe wasn't ex expected every it seems like every day we find a new applications for these large language models and yet another thing that they can do here and when i when i saw this i was reminded of a, a friend of mine who had like similar ideas but it never really materialized i tried some of this stuff as well combining large language models with planning with telling me what to do in the real world i even made a video where GPT-3 told me a recipe and then I cooked the rest, like me and my friend, we cooked the recipe and so on. But it seemed like always a bit, um, a bit out of place, a bit, a bit off just to give you detailed instructions. And uh, when I saw a paper that was really trying to make this work in a real environment, uh, I was, I was hap very happy to see that. Uh, and yeah, that's, that is, that is this paper, and also to be said, you have a you have a stellar board of of uh, co collaborators right here. Um, how how did this come about? Like, how did you even get to the idea? Hey, I could use these language models to do planning. Was it like did it immediately come to you? Did it sort of build up from some basic idea, or what was the process? So yeah. Um, thanks for the um, brief intro. I think that's uh, actually came out to be really surprising to us as well. Uh, so first, uh, we were just having um, when we just play around with um, the largest language models uh, on the on many of the web uh, interface. Uh, we found that like actually there is something there. Like you said, if you mm -hmm. um, ask it for a recipe, or uh, we actually originally study um, like whether it can output the steps for making coffee, et cetera. So we found that like when the models get large enough, there's actually something there. And this is the sign of life, I think, um, for us to kind of um, go on and investigate how we can make that actually um, useful for, for um, agents. So um, we kind of just started from there. And actually, uh, it came out to be pretty surprising. Originally, we thought like maybe we need some training data set to maybe like train something, a, a translator or something to uh, actually make it useful. But it turns out like, uh, but we're really trying to constrain ourselves in, in, in the meantime because we don't want it to be tailored to a specific environment. 
so we just want to see like just the language model itself like how how well it can do how far it can go mm -hmm. so um this is what got us got us in the end um we, we just like um explored for like two months and then found like you can actually do this uh without any any training and um it yeah it's actually truly um surprising and actually um actually a really fun project for me as well mm -hmm. <laughs> just it, it sounds I'm, like fun yeah just, just trying to see uh whether you can output something like really uh, mm -hmm. realistic and, and really fun yeah yeah so you you came you came across this this environment right here this um virtual home environment was this always the plan or why did you choose like there are a million environments open ai gym and and there there move you know these mujoko kind of robot simulations why was this one particularly useful did you in immediately think of this one or how did this came about thanks yeah so actually uh i wasn't um doing too much research in in, in this uh in body agents uh, area, uh, especially for, for this like really high level tasks. And then I actually went, went to the like Google Scholar and then searched for mm -hmm. um, appropriate environments for this. And we found this virtual home environment and we, we really liked it because it actually um, can model any, uh, any tasks if you can express them um, in terms of this like uh, textual uh, language plan. Um, mm -hmm. like a, like just, just a like textual plan. So, um, and actually there are many, many other environments as well, but some of them are limited by, um, I think a lot of people, uh, also use Alfred environment. Uh, that's a really good environment too. And I think, uh, it's a bit more structured there, but, um, the tasks are often come from, um, like a template. So it's usually yeah. like pick something, pull something. Um, but actually there are a lot of challenges there. I think it's a different set of challenges. And we found like what the virtual home tackles um, is exactly what we look for because uh, it can model like any task expressed in free form language, uh, mm -hmm. especially those like really challenging tasks like people do actually every day, uh, like make breakfast, make tea, uh, make coffee. And then um, it particularly cares about um, the common sense constraints in, in them. So uh, specifically, this environment has um, a set of like uh, preconditions and post conditions for each action. So for, mm -hmm. for example, if you want to grab a glass of milk from, from the fridge, you can't just like say, go to the fridge and grab a glass of milk because yeah. you first gotta open the fridge first and then uh, like, preferably you want to close the fridge afterwards. So it's really this like, um, these constraints, I think um, are really useful and really interesting to study whether the language models can, can handle this. Mm -hmm. And you, you've, you've investigated several different language models. And just to be clear, this environment, it has this kind of syntax. It has very defined things you can do. And somewhere I think you say it's about 50,000 actions that are ultimately possible it's kind of a combination of a bunch of verbs which are grab open go to and uh, lift or things like this and a bunch of objects like kitchen fridge and so on so any plan would consist of a sequence of verb object verb object like here uh, walk to kitchen open fridge grab milk so the 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 any planner in this environment would have to output this syntax directly. Now, you had a plan of not training anything, right? You didn't want to train anything. You simply wanted to investigate what knowledge is already there in the language models. And you came up with kind of a way to translate that. Do you want to maybe elaborate? How do you, how do you yeah. query these language models and how do you make them actually conform to the, to the, uh, the, the, the yeah, syntax yeah. here of course yeah so um the um the way that virtual home uh expresses these actions are uh via like this specific format where you put a square bracket um like uh for the action atomic action like grab put open mm -hmm. and then you put uh i think it's a parenthesis uh or or yeah something for for the arguments 
And um, but the the problem is like we, we can't just like expect language models to to handle this because um, I I mean even if we put an example in front, maybe they can do it, but it's definitely not the the way that usually humans um, yeah. produce language. So and after all, these language models are trained on human text. So we we decide like maybe it's not the the right way to query these models. Maybe we just want have, to have you ever tried. Have you tried letting them output directly the syntax or was it just like, yeah, it's not going to work anyway? I tried briefly, but it's definitely not uh, thoroughly investigated. Uh, and yeah. like, it, like in, intuition wise, I think it's definitely sure, um, yeah. to, <laughs> to, to to use like natural language. But we, we did adopt for the um, the most basic approach that we can we can think of, which is like just define a straight up like um, template for, for each atomic action and actually because these atomic actions are uh, simple enough like just walk grab and those things so uh, this atomic action I mean the template the templates we actually came up with uh, are I think actually just, just a natural way like people people say things so mm -hmm. like um, turn off something turn off something um, and then add uh, some some words in between like in on mm -hmm. on top of Etc. And yeah. and then and then you you just query these models and you have multiple ways of evaluating this, right? You care about two things: you care about correctness and you care about uh, executability. And in at least, um, so you also make use of of humans. Like, how did you how did you design? Like, what was your thinking behind designing the evaluation? Yeah, so actually, uh, it, it came out to be really challenging to evaluate these things. Um, like I said, so like um, this, this tasks are because they're expressed in freeform language. So that mm. means they're really open ended. So it, it might be deterministic whether like if you want to grab a glass of milk, you just want to look in the end whether you have a glass of milk. But uh, if you really think about it, if we don't want to constrain anything in, in the task that we want to we want to do, like making breakfast, like what mm -hmm. is the correct way to make breakfast? Everyone has different preferences. So it's hard for us, uh, actually, um, I think it's still a challenge um, in, in this sort of task is like really determine it, the correctness. Uh, I mean, sorry, it's the success rate for, for each task. So mm -hmm. you can't really tell if a task is really successful depending on how open-ended it is. So uh, yeah. we decided that uh, okay, so it's, if it's hard to computationally produce a metric for uh, success rate, um, like, but as humans, we can definitely tell if it's making something semantically meaningful. So uh, mm -hmm. we just uh, use part of like human evaluations to do this, but we don't want to s entirely rely on humans because, uh, as you can tell, for the uh, for the text that like for the action plan that real language models generate. They're so realistic that like they can even fool many humans that yeah. like they're too realistic. So uh, you can't just entirely rely on humans to to say if it's successful. So we also mm -hmm. uh, use this metric executability, which is also used in in past papers from um, in like that uses uh, virtual home. So uh, yeah. we we just use this metric as well to basically determine whether the plan satisfy uh, the common sense constraints uh, in, in this environment, namely just like whether you like open, make sure to open the fridge before grabbing something from it. Yeah. Something like this. And it's interesting because th when the humans rate it, the humans would also skip a bunch of steps, right? If you, if you tell a human, go to the fridge and grab a glass of milk, the human will go like, oh yeah, of course. All right. Which is, which is one of my, um, maybe this is jumping ahead a little bit, but one of the questions I had most when I read this was just there is a level of specificity that is required right here, which is kind of ambiguous, right? You have a high level description, which is like make breakfast, right? And then you have a bunch of steps, which you need to follow. And sure, these steps correspond to actions in the environment. So they're kind of given by that. But the language model doesn't know that, right? The language model just knows I need to produce a plan. So how is the language model, you know, why do why do we expect the language model to figure out that it needs to like, that it can't, that it needs to say, 
open the fridge before you get a glass. But it, for example, it doesn't need to say put one foot in front of the other foot, you know, in order to walk. Yeah. Um, so, you know, did you have any insights or concerns with like, there, there seems to be like a very specific level of specificity of these plans. Yeah, so uh, that's a really good question. Actually, um, this granularity actually comes from the data set uh, or mm-hmm. namely the, vir- the virtual home environment uh, itself yeah. because the way, um, because we essentially follow the format of uh, virtual home environment and also mm-hmm. this data set they collected for, from humans uh, of how to do um, this really uh, like human activity task. So the way they collect, they, they build this environment is they first um, ask um, many humans to come up with uh, a set of tasks that they do in everyday household. And then they mm-hmm. ask a different group of human to come up with a um, detailed plan that can drive a robot to do to perform these tasks. And and it's after that they build this environment based on mm-hmm. the verbs used by, by those humans. So you can think of like this environment is really built on top of uh, what humans say. Now, now yeah. specifically the developers um, who uh, who just say like, okay, we want this granularity, we want this like walk, grab, and those etc. So um, they actually ask these humans to give those verbs and the, uh, verbs, and then um, build those actions uh, according to the, those verbs. And they did make sure to for each of the verb to develop a set of common sense constraints, which completely makes sense. And I, I think they're uh, actually um, like reasonably exhaustive for, for, for those actions. So mm-hmm. if you want to grab something, you definitely need to make sure the things you grab is not within a closed container, for example. So yeah. uh, in this case, the fridge is a con- container and it has this attribute of uh, being open or being closed. So mm-hmm. uh, they internally keep track of the attributes for, for each of the, uh, each of the object. And then to make sure that like, if you do something like this, you don't violate the um, the, the common sense constraints. So uh, to answer your question, so like this this granularity really depends on the humans, um, and like I think this is where language models really shine because it essentially language models are, are trained on human produced text. So my yeah. hypothesis, although this is definitely not something thoroughly tested, but my my hypothesis is that because it's trained on human produced text and humans after all produce these actions. So yeah. if you do, uh, do it careful enough and then use some techniques to uh, properly translate them or doing something else, you mm-hmm. can essentially get back something similar to what yeah. human produced in the beginning. Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, you would, you would imagine that sort of the humanness of how the environment was built would also be present a little bit in these language models, which makes which sense. I, d- I don't have a better idea like of how to build an environment like this. So yeah, I it think seems it's pretty, really, pretty reasonable. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's actually cannot to be really like uh, interesting to me because it's like it's just super hard for me uh, if I were to develop this environment, like how would you even yeah. animate like all this like really like human tasks in, in mm-hmm. uh, even just in the household setting it's super difficult and uh, i think they, they did did a really good job here and then mm-hmm. i think uh, this is also what makes like language models particularly useful for yeah. for this task because these are basically just human tasks and language yeah. models are really good at like mimicking humans yeah yeah yeah, so on the on the left here, we see a bunch of models that you've evaluated right here. So again, executability is sort of how like if it if it matches the syntax of the environment, if if I can map it to that, and also I guess if it if it violates any of these common sense constraints. Um, so just like how executable is the plan in the environment, no matter whether it's the wrong thing, right? And that comes yeah. in in a, in a second. And correctness is a thing that is rated by human annotators. They look at the plan that was produced and they just, from their own intuition, are like, well, is this a good plan to make breakfast? Yes or no? And we clearly see, like, there is there's this downward trend. If we exclude the models on the right, there is this 
trend line here where the larger models, they seem to produce more correct plans, which means plans that the humans like more, but they are less less executable. Whereas the smaller models, they are less correct, which, you know, we can... That's correct. I would have expected that, but they're more executable. Yeah. And you've, you've noticed in the paper that very often they just produce plans that have nothing to do with the task description. They would just produce like a plan uh, that is according to the syntax of the examples that you give in the prompt, right? Um, but how can you explain that? Like even, even on the top here, like the, the large models, it's even better than humans at correctness. So yeah. humans rating other humans think that GPT-3 produces more correct correct plans. Why is it so bad at executability? Yeah, so uh, there are actually two questions uh, that like uh, I think you, you raised. One is uh, mm. why this like smaller models, like um, like when I say smaller, it's actually still pretty large, the large yeah. GPT, uh, GPT-2 model. So why do they produce like more executable plans? Uh, and the second question is uh, why the GPT-3, the large GPT-3 model, it's actually better than human. So to answer the first question, um, uh, I think that's because uh, we, we did find some failure modes here uh, for, for smaller models. Uh, I think the two most um, prominent ones are, uh, first, it, it tries it frequently tries to um, like repeat the given example. For example, you, you give it like how to browse internet. You said like go mm. out to the computer and, and use uh, type on the keyboard, etc. And then you ask it to brush teeth, it still goes like goes to the computer and then and then type out on the <laughs> keyboard. So it's totally um, nothing like sensible here. And then the second source of error is sometimes it uh, just outputs really short plans. If you say like uh, sleep task, uh, go to sleep, it's just like go to go go to the bad bedroom and and just stops yeah. it. So um, the, I mean, that's yeah, plans, that's right. this this right here. Brush teeth, it's just like go to bathroom. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Down, so, yeah. so, so, uh, when when these plans are short enough, even though it can be executed, like if you just say like walk to bathroom, walk to bedroom, just one single action, like for walk, there is not much like uh, common sense constraints uh, there. So, like, yeah, uh, I, you can totally imagine like it's super executable. But uh, if you present them to humans, of course, like humans will, will spot this and then say, okay, this is not correct. Because we, when we do human evaluations, we we're trying to make it simple so that the um, the the error here is not too big. Because we, we don't ask like hundreds of humans to evaluate this. We only uh, ask got to ask ten uh, evaluators mm -hmm. in this case. So um, uh, so that's why like the, the smaller models are now really good at scalability. Mm -hmm. And and the second question that you ask is why um, this like larger models um, are actually better than humans. So uh, we actually this is not a completely fair comparison if you just look at one axis. So all the results really be look at from, from two axes that we care about. So one is the uh, semantic correctness, which is evaluated by humans, mm -hmm. and the second is the executability. So yeah. this human plans that we use are from this data set that um, virtual home developers uh, yeah. like crowdsource from, from, from Amazon Turkers. So uh, these plans, they make sure that like these are executable plans. So mm -hmm. which means um, that they're, they have one hand like here. Like they, yeah. They'd be over so, here. Yeah. But, but we, we don't want to put the spot right there uh, yeah. like on the right because uh, it's it's hard to see because humans are are a big um, baseline and reference here. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not the baseline that we're trying to beat. Of course, like GPT three yeah. is not there yet in terms of like uh, at the same time outputting correct uh, action plans and semantic semantically correct action plans and also mm -hmm. being able to really ground them in the environment. But <clears throat> yeah. we can using this two axes, we can really see. Uh, for example, which is the uh, which axis is the the place that as a community that we we may want to work more on uh, mm -hmm. to get it better to to get the human levels and with this yeah. paper that we we kind of find this uh, result uh, actually a bit interesting to us uh, is that like for for these larger models uh, like in terms of semantic correctness 
you don't need to worry too much about it. It's mm -hmm. kind of already there if you uh, if you if you do it, um, extract them. Um, but the real question is, how do we make them executable for uh, yeah. agents that we that we care about? And this and that's exactly what what yeah. you do, right? In the in like the meat of the paper, and the result are these these translated models right here uh, that. You know, notably, they do drop a little bit in terms of their correctness as rated by humans, but they gain massively in executability. And this is the result of a, a bunch of different ingredients, like three main ingredients, as far as I could tell. Do you quickly want to go, like, tell what, like, what the ingredients are to make whatever these models output into what something that, I mean, you know, the virtual home is maybe a test bed, right? It's not, yeah. I, I don't see this paper being about virtual home. It's more like, here is a model that outputs something, yet I need the output in some other form, right? In, in, in this is a very general problem, has many applications. And if we could solve that bridge, that technically is, you know, is, is a big gain. That's exactly what you do. Uh, so how, how did you go about this? Yeah, so uh, actually, uh, I just want to make sure that uh, actually this paper just present a, a really like preliminary step. I, I don't think it mm -hmm. solves anything particularly. I mean, it, it does like if this promise. Sure, but it's a big like, step. I I believe. Like, I mean, you you the the executability like, raises pretty pretty high. I I don't I didn't want to oversell you, but also <laughs> not not undersell you certainly. Yeah. So, um, but to, to answer the question, so, uh, so, so we actually found like, uh, there's actually, uh, as you said, there are three ingredients, but central mm -hmm. to this, uh, is, uh, one simple, really simple technique that we found, uh, that's the most useful, which is action translation. So, um, because in, in this virtual home environment, the actions that, uh, it supports are, uh, are a limited set. I mean, it's not small, but. It's something mm -hmm. that we can definitely enumerate with our computational hardware and in like in, in a really quick manner. So like just um, like one tenth of a second or something, uh, something like that. So let's say if we can enumerate all the actions that are supported by, by the environment, mm -hmm. then uh, the question now becomes how do we translate the uh, this really sensible action plans generated by language models for but not really executable plans. How can we translate that into uh, those actions supported by environment? Or if you want to deploy some, deploy something in the in the real world, let's say your robot mm -hmm. only supports ten actions. Um, how do you uh, map those texts into the ten actions that the the robot supports? So what mm -hmm. we found is that you first need to en enumerate all the actions, and then. We found that you can again leverage the um, the world knowledge uh, in these language models by using another language model. Namely, here we reuse uh, Roberta, which is a, a language model really similar to uh, to Bert, and it's a mm -hmm. different language model because it essentially um, it, it's a mass language model. So it's really good at outputting a useful embedding um, mm -hmm. to like in terms of uh, about the semantic. Uh, meaning for for that sentence. So what we do yeah. is that we take the sentence output by GPT three or Codex, and then uh, we just compare that against all the possible um, admissible actions, allowed actions by the environments, mm -hmm. and then we found the most similar one in terms of like um, this distance in in the embedding space. Um, yeah, we actually use just cosine distance and and found that to work decently well. Yeah. So. so yeah. Yeah, I have, I have like, th there's like an entire space somewhere and you just place all the actions. I guess you can even pre-compute those, right? You can pre-compute the embedding of exactly, all yeah. possible yeah. actions there. Yeah. And once my language model outputs anything at all, all I need to do is ship it through the Roberta model, get its embedding, put it somewhere, get the nearest neighbor. And that's my kind of translated action. So here you have an example that would that would translate like squeeze out a glob of lotion into poor lotion into right hand. Yeah. So this it would exactly. map yeah, action into and poor poor it would be the verb, lotion kind of the object, and right hand also one of the objects. So maybe like there's two arguments to poor. Um 
yeah I, I mean this makes it it is it seems very simple but I, I i was at a talk by the people who made the first version of the you know in gmail you you have these th always like three options to respond to like the quick quick options to respond right yeah, yeah. and and the I think the first, I'm not sure how it is done now, but the first version of this, we were like, wow, this is, you know, you know, cool. It actually takes, you know, it takes into account the, the email message that was there. We always thought it was kind of like a, a, a language model, generative model somewhere. So I went to a talk and they were just like, no, we just have a big list of responses. We just classify right <laughs> whatever we, we just take your message right and we just put it through a model and then we just classify into this big big bucket of possible answers so i mean this is even though it is it is simple it's 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 very powerful um powerful method and that being said you don't even train this you take an off-the-shelf embedding model and you compute nearest neighbors and it does turn out quite well you you do however you talk about this in the paper there is a bunch of problems and one of the problems i see is whenever a step contains like multiple steps right is that uh, like is that a big have you found this to be a big problem because this just maps one action to one other action but if it's like you know open the fridge and take a glass of milk then i have essentially no way of translating that into an admissible sequence yeah, uh, that's a that's a good question, and I think that's uh, one of the so uh, main errors that like this uh, this Roberta model that we use. It's actually a sentence Roberta mo model mm -hmm. because uh, it's trained with a different objective, such that it can really uh, you you can actually calculate cosine uh, distance um, be between the embeddings they generate. So it's a mm -hmm. uh, like we found like it's pretty difficult to map a compounded action like you said like um like two actions in, in one sentence into one admissible action but this mm. is um partly mitigated by how you tune the temperature sam uh, the sampling parameter uh just the temperature for the gpt3 or codex models because yeah. we found that if you do increase the temperature um then it tends to output something more um verbally expressive answers um, for, for each step. So that means it's harder to translate. And we, mm -hmm. uh, if you, um, if you try like all this, like different settings, we, we, did, we, in the end, we found like, usually you want to use like a uh, lower temperature than, than what people mostly use for language generation, for example. Yeah. So, so that like each action uh, is uh, like small enough and succinct enough. And then, and then after we translate this action, uh, so, it, so so that it's easier for this bird model, uh, Roberta model, to translate. And uh, yeah, something I forgot to mention, like uh, after we got this translated action, uh, we found that it's still useful to put that back to the original prompt, put the translated yeah. action back instead of like the original action, so that you can yeah. let the GPT three and Codex model to um, to reason um, like how am I going to do based on this like action already yeah. performed? Um, so, so yeah, like you said, the, uh, like you pointed, this is the third uh, sub figure here. Um, so we would take instead of instead of generating the entire plan at once, we just generate one action, then we translate it and then we substitute essentially whatever GPT-3 output with whatever the translated thing is and then based on that create the, the next action it makes sense because you it's it's like almost like a guiding like a bit of a guardrail uh for for the language model instead if you were to let it generate all at once and then you translate each action individually they almost like lose connection to each other right exactly, so this yeah it, this here might mitigate some of this this stuff, right? If I have a compound action, like go to the fridge and grab a glass, and the closest, I hope that the closest sentence is the go to fridge, right? Yeah. Um, the the language model might still recover and recognize, aha, I haven't, you know, grabbed, uh, haven't grabbed a glass yet. So that is, so these are improvements one and two, and then the third, the third uh, thing you found that really helps is the prompt up here. So the the priming, which I think. In GPT-3, it's, it's very common to have these priming prompts to tell the model what kind of stuff you 
uh, you expect as an output. I was surprised to see that you only have one priming prompt, um, whereas in general people put more than one. Uh, usually people put like three or something like this. Is there a particular reason why you used just one? There is actually not that particular reason. I uh, yeah. We actually found like, uh, I mean, uh, so in the beginning, we 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 were uh, we we know that we have this data set, right? And then we uh, we found uh, originally we actually tried to train something to to achieve this, but in the end we found that like we don't even need to train something, and yeah. uh, like uh, now the question becomes like how, like can you even leverage this data set to some extent mm -hmm. to make it useful? Um, of course, uh, this is something like additional. I mean. Uh, it would definitely be better without any any of this. But if you have this data set, you can uh, actually find like um, this most similar example uh, uh, to the query task here. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. like this is apply lotion. So um, like shave task shave is determined to be most similar. Uh, yeah. Again, judged by this Roberta model using the same mm -hmm. technique. Yeah. So um, uh, I think that that's the that's the main motivation for using this, but we, we didn't thoroughly investigate it, like how you structure the prompt, whether you yeah. you add like multiple things there and then, um, or, or you change the template here because I just defined this template from day one, like task something, step one, something, step yeah. two something. Maybe there is a better template. Maybe you want to add some instruction there to make it better. And um, so I like, I mean, this is definitely possible. and. We don't invest in them here because we, we just don't just want to get the best performance out of this. We want to show people like this is something possible and uh, it's really interesting to us. So that's why um, we ended up like um, like just using the, the most simple technique here. Yeah, and, and to answer your question why we don't put multiple uh, things there, uh, I think one important reason is like uh, because this example plans that we put in front are uh, produced by humans. And uh, this is because due to the space constraint, I'm using a like oversimplified version uh, in, in this figure specifically. But in, uh, in, in, pra in practice, these plans are actually pretty long. So, um, and they actually already take up a lot of space uh, in the prompt. So if you to put more than one, uh, sometimes it gets too long and um, I mean, it's, it's maybe something handleable by by larger models, but we just mm -hmm. opt for the most similar, uh, most simple case. And I actually read this like there's a recent paper investigating why, uh, in context learning works, they frame this as a implicit Bayesian inference problem, and they did come to a conclusion that the longer the prompt, if I remember correctly, um, like it helps the model. So so in this way, you kind of like trade off the number of examples you put and the, the, the length of the of each example. So mm -hmm. in those cases, I think you mentioned um, many people put many examples um, before the query. Um, those are usually the the cases where uh, the, the tasks they care about are um, like smaller. So for example, like you want to ask Einstein was born somewhere uh, then like this is a, just a sentence. So you probably want yeah. to put like more than one sentence there. But this this case, our case is like, it's an extensive action plan. So it's already pretty lengthy and we, we don't want to go um, too, too crazy over here. Mm. I mean, it's, yeah, so, sorry that the, the recording has stopped on the screen side, but oh, we, okay. can, we can still see it. Okay. Um, yeah, so yeah, I was I was I was quite interested in in that in the sense of of the prompt structuring because I know that can also uh make a big difference, but I also like the sort of approach of not having too many moving parts, you know, in uh in one single in one single thing because it makes things complicated and for many papers it uh it makes you wonder like what was exactly the thing that gave uh, the the improvement here. Now you you do uh, very good ablations of all of these different improvements, which I uh, really liked. And you showed that kind of the translation is the the main part right here. Although the other things uh, certainly also help. Have you ever? Uh, so it reminds me a bit of this. You know this retro model. 
uh, these language models that retrieve from the internet as they produce text, it reminds a little bit of this, right? In that um, you 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 produce, uh, you go and retrieve the closest samples in the data set as you produce the text. Um, it yeah, I think the this combination of retrieval and generation is picking up steam, uh, yeah, and and it looks pretty interesting. My question is a little bit, have you tried also, because essentially you now rely on this translation procedure to to produce the correct actions. Have you tried any way to like let the model know what the possible actions are? Like something like, you know, I can imagine maybe I, I you know, I ask the model first and then I get maybe the five closest actions or the 10 closest actions in embedding space. And then I somehow put these in the prompt here, like, you know, in between, you know, what am I going to do next? Um, is it this or this or this or this, right? And then the model could, maybe I could prime the model to output one of them. And, you know, is is there, did you tr try any, any way of, of, telling the model more what's even possible in the environment because right now you're essentially relying on on just the language model itself yeah that's a really good question too so like uh we actually didn't try the specific thing that you you talk about like generate a bunch of uh, yeah. possible actions and then ask the model again uh which of this are are the best uh but we did try something similar which is uh like beam search so Essentially, in Beam Search, you look ahead uh, to see like what yeah. tokens are um, are like having in the end get the the, the highest uh, likelihood. So um, we we did try to constrain the vocabulary um, that can be uh, used in in the Beam Search, but this mm -hmm. is only conducted on smaller models because uh, obviously the GPT three and Codex models are now open to um, fully yeah. open to public. So we can't. We we don't really have full access to yeah, um, yeah like I different see. features like um because you can't restrict think, the vocabulary dynamically. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I've only done this on smaller model, uh, relatively mm -hmm. smaller models like uh, the GBT Neo, uh, and then I think I might have tried on GBT J as well, which is a six billion parameter model, and mm -hmm. uh, it actually turns out that they don't do really well with uh, if you really just constrain the vocabulary that way. Uh, and yeah. specifically just the, just the beam search constraining the uh, vocabulary can generate. But uh, so my hypothesis, so this is now thoroughly tested because it's now invested on larger models as well. Mm -hmm. um, but my intuition why it doesn't work so well is that this lo language models are really trained on human text. So it really, it's re it, they're really used to how humans um, speak a certain language, uh, in this case, yeah. English. So, like people don't speak things in this way. Step one, something. Yeah. Step two, something. Step three, something. So that's why if you really constrain the models this way, a lot of the um, the, the the world knowledge encoded in these models are uh, lost. So basically, um, and personally, just a, a personal opinion, I, I don't think these models are doing um, like super intelligent reasoning here. It's basically just doing uh, kind of retrieving what's uh, what is trained on, so uh, retrieving this like large scale um, text. So if you want to retrieve better, you better um, adopt the same way that humans speak um, a language. So yeah. uh, like if you don't constrain the vocabulary, you can get the most out of a, a language model. And you can really mm -hmm. tell if you adjust the temperature, um, like if you go different temperature, they can tell you like different um, levels of things. and they can be really realistic, but if you really constrain it, a lot of this knowledge is lost, and yeah. um, it's it can't really do too much like common sense reasoning here. I was you you mentioned this a bunch of times. I was surprised to find Codex as a model, and so you you have you have uh, these these are sort of vanilla models, uh, and and then you have the translated ones where all your all your uh, improvements are in there. So there is the the action translation, um, there is the sampling, even according according to uh, the 
probability and executability. There, I, there is the retrieval of the closest prompt and so on. And these translated models, they perform really well. What I was surprised by and also by the results is that Codex, I mean, that it's even in here, it's like a code model, but also that comparably it holds up, right? It's it's not as good as the GPT-3 model, but it's also very, very much smaller. So, you know, parameter by parameter, Codex is outshining uh, GPT on this task very well. How did you, how did you even consider using Codex, and and how can you explain that this model is is doing so well? Yeah. So, why intuition? Why uh, we actually this actually came out to be pretty surprising to us as well. So, uh, we, we we did find like this Codex models are really good at generating these plans, and uh, actually from my own experience playing with these models. I, I did find like um, Codex thinks that this is part of some dog stream. So yeah. it's uh, it's actually imagining like people just like asking the dog stream here, but instead of letting keep generating the code, uh, we kind of just stop here. So, okay, yeah. finish the dog stream for us, that's enough. So, um, so yeah, so it's actually doing some of this kind of dog stream uh, it generates this dog string thing. And I, the reason I think the smaller codex model are actually better than the same size uh, GPT-3 model is that um, be, because it's trained on a more structured data, so like code. Mm -hmm. And specifically, many of this, um, like this code examples uh, in, in the data set, in the training data set, consists of dog string and, 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 and the code. So it not only, not only can handle code really well, it can also generate really realistic dog strings. So, mm -hmm. and in people in dog string, they don't write in um, like- Yeah, they don't write a novel. Yeah, yeah, so they write something really step-by-step step and have mm -hmm. more structure in it. So that's my intuition why uh, it actually does really well with this task. So you can really process this sequential, um, like logical reasoning better than, yeah. than the same uh, size GPT, GPT-3 model. But of course, if you use a larger model, that potentially be more helpful, mm -hmm. yeah. Or, I mean, there is, as you said, there is still a lot of open like questions about how exactly you structure the prompts. Like maybe this step one, step two, step three isn't ideal for these language models. Maybe you need to more let them write like a, like a Reddit post or something about, you know, how they, how they went and got a glass of milk yesterday and then translate that somehow. Uh, but yeah, it's it's pretty cool. So one thing that, that just came to my attention right here is this top row right here, which I found hilarious. So this is, <laughs> the task is complete Amazon Turk surveys. So the, the, the four steps apparently that you need to do is walk to home office, sit on chair, switch on computer, look at computer <laughs> like that's is this the like is this the is this the this is the description of complete Tur amazon turk it's a pretty accurate description maybe of what <laughs> amazon turk workers yeah, do so, so like i said these tasks are generated by um by, by crowdsource uh, from yeah. humans and this uh, the humans here happen to be amazon turkers so one yeah. of them decided that okay if you want me to generate, <laughs> like generate some tasks i would say like just complete service on amazon uh, amazon yeah. so they decided to put one of this here and we found this hilarious too so um uh, like like i said so, so this language model so they can't really handle uh, anything that you wanted to um to yeah. generate. so we, because we, we did put the um, example uh, in the front. So uh, I think in this case, the example ha happens to be something related to computer and um, the, the models actually happen to reason uh, or it potentially you could just repeat the example, but depending on other tasks, uh, it doesn't seem like that's the case, but it does come to the reasoning that like um, this might be something related to computer too. And I'm gonna yeah. put like the steps here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, I mean, it has something like melancholic and it also has something a bit, as you said, rebellious of like, you know, I'm here doing my, my Amazon Turk work. I'm gonna, you know, I'm just gonna put my Easter egg in there in this, in this data set or, or like um, show you. But it also shows something, I think about the interaction with this environment because, 
you know, if you ask me, you know, what did you do today? I could tell you, uh, you know, I programmed this, I viewed a pull request, I sent some email and so on. But in the action space of this environment, this would all just be characterized as go to desk, sit on chair, <laughs> switch on computer, look at computer. And yeah, so, so it is really and maybe also a constraint of the environment um, itself. And, and, and it, as I said, I think the challenge is going to be there's so much knowledge in these language models and we somehow need to get it out into the domain that we care about. And yeah, I guess, I guess many opportunities are still there. And in this particular environment, is it, so the way I see it, we have this environment, it's a 3D environment, but you never actually, for the, your studies, you never actually had to actually execute anything in the environment. Is that correct? Or do I see something wrong here? Uh, I think those, uh, when you say execute, do you mean like um, like run in the environment? Yeah, yeah like run the, the, the 3D environment, like ac actually oh. you know, give it to the environment. Because yeah. you, you evaluate executability, you can do with a parser, right? Uh, to see whether it matches the actions and constraints. And the, the correctness you evaluate with the humans, uh, because my question was also a little bit like, why can't I just run it and see if, you know, at the end there's breakfast, but you already, you already said that the tasks are so, so yeah. open, like, how would you, how would you detect there's breakfast, right? Um, so, yeah. so, uh, in terms of, uh, so a bit background here for, for the virtual mm -hmm. environment. So it comes in two versions. One is the, I think that they call the evolving graph version which mm -hmm. is a pure, like you said, a state machine, a, a Python, a, like written in Python. So it just goes in and then checks which, uh, whether the actions can be parsed and then yeah. whether it satisfy the, the common sense constraint. And the other version they implement uh, is this, um, is this visual, visualized version where they uh, actually only implement a subset of uh, the, act, the total action supported um, mm -hmm. in the environment. So, I think they, uh, so in the evolving graph version, the Python version, there are 42 actions. And in the visualized version, there are only 10 actions. So yeah. it's limited, uh, like the, the plans we can generate, uh, we can really visualize are limited. So that's also part of the reason we don't show the visualized version to humans. Uh, like, can you tell us whether this is successful or not? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's that's a um, that's indeed something we, we can't do right now, and I yeah. think that's like as a community, um, as we go go on like to this next step with more complex tasks that humans do every day instead of just like a lower level task. Um, as a community, I think that more efforts can be can be put here and um, to develop better uh, simulator and also maybe beyond even household environment. So yes, yeah. just as a uh, as a story here, I, I, I did play around with the codex and then GPT-3 models to have it generate something out of the household domain. And seems like they, they do have some, a lot of knowledge for those as well. So if you can ask it, how do, how do I pay bills at a restaurant and how do I work out at the gym? And I think um, in, uh, on Twitter, there's also someone tries to, uh, after the posting of this paper, they, they try to ask the uh, GPT-3 model, how do I start a company? <laughs> so yeah. they, they do have a lot of knowledge for this. And as long as you can provide a set of actions that are um, necessary to complete these tasks, uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, no matter what, what the granularity is, it, ideally it should be at the same granularity as uh, of, of humans. So ideally it should be, uh, these models should be able to generate something something sensible and reasonable. But yeah. definitely right now is something that you definitely can't trust to, to put on a robot, of course. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, I've always, I've always seen people um, thinking when they think GPT-3 or so, they, they, and they think, for example, of video games, they always imagine, you know, we, we can have our NPC, our characters, the, the, the dialogue be generated by GPT-3. So it, it, the dialogue is more realistic. But I think this shows that it can go further if we are able to map sort of GPT-3's knowledge into a sort of structured domain that we choose, we could potentially also let these models generate the action sequences of like 
of of characters for example let's say in video games because that's like a common complaint that you know the the guards they always walk up and then down and then left and then right and then up and then down and right they have these even if the dialogue gets really good it their their behavior is still kind of lame either that or they they cheat they know where you are at all times um but with i feel with models like this we can almost like take this common sense knowledge and maybe have the hopes of transferring that to to various domains and infuse a lot of areas with common sense and that i find that to be i find that that to be pretty cool yeah, yeah in a, itself that would be really exciting and interesting application yeah yeah so i i mean yeah there, there's a lot of a lot of things to be gained so i what i did i i was specifically intrigued about clip i don't know if you are thinking about this or not um but what i what i tried to do is i tried to take like a frame of pac-man like and and you know there, there's like walls here and here and uh and and here and i had pac-man be like you know here facing a wall and then there's like a ghost behind pac-man right and and then there is like these little dots over here to to eat and so it was like super clear what you have to do so i tried to feed that to clip and you know you can make clip classify things by just evaluating a bunch of different yeah. strings with it so i like try to i try to evaluate the strings go left go up go right go down or like pac-man should go left pac-man should go up but it never worked out um so if you can if you could get something like this running, this would be amazing. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, with maybe with your knowledge, maybe Pac-Man isn't the right environment because Clip was trained on whatever picture scraped from Instagram. Um, but I think just this this type of you know thinking beyond just the strings in terms of language, but thinking in terms of I have some structured environment and I want to leverage this this knowledge of these uh, models is is super cool. Yeah, that would be a super interesting application. I think uh, using Clip here, uh, would like because it fills in another uh, modality, which is image, could be really interesting as well. I think it kind of solves uh, one of the major limitations of this paper, uh, namely just the uh, because currently we, we generate plants regardless of the environment state. So it doesn't condition on environment state and potentially using clip, you can encode something there because you can also take image as input to, um, to an image can serve, can serve as state uh, for, for, yeah. your, for the environment. I think that would be really cool. And um, yeah, so um, yeah. So just um, uh, to be to be clear to the listeners, the, the basic idea for this I have from from uh, a PhD student that was partially in our lab uh, called Gian Battista Parascandolo. So uh, the the credit fully goes to him of of this whole idea. I don't want to, but I just it got me thinking so much about you know we can extract this knowledge into into other modalities, and that's that's pretty cool. Is there anything you want to maybe? Uh, say about the experiments is there anything that was very surprising to you or you know something you didn't expect or something you particularly want to highlight um I, actually i think we, we covered most things uh but i think i might say something about the the the, the baseline here i as you can mm -hmm. probably see except for the human references we also uh, got to fine tune a, a gpt3 version and we did find that fine tuning can can be a really strong baseline here because mm -hmm. uh, as you can probably tell the uh, one of the measures here lcs uh, which is the longest common subsequence uh, yeah. this this measure here is much higher than the others uh, so yeah. this measure basically uh, calculates how much overlapping there is uh, in your generated plants against uh, those plants written by humans. So it's kind of calculating this um, IOU score. Um, so um, we, we did find that find this to be a strong baseline. And uh, I think it, it, it still actually makes sense to to be a strong baseline because this is trained on, on such data. And uh, so this is kind of to illustrate that like um, if you do have domain data, it's still really helpful to, to train your models, uh, fine tune your models this way. Um, but yeah. if you don't have something like this, uh, you can potentially just leverage the, uh, the knowledge already in this language models. Mm -hmm. 
Cool. Um, yeah. So where where does your future lie? What are you? I I I are you going to are you going more into this direction, or was this sort of like a, a one off thing, or do you have? I mean, uh, what what are the interesting questions that that you are asking now? Maybe as a follow up to this. Yeah. So. Uh... I personally, I haven't decided because I, I'm in a yeah. stage where, um, like, uh, I'm applying to PhD programs and 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 also uh, other positions. Uh, so, um, like, but but as a follow up, I think it would be really interesting. Uh, as I mentioned, one limitation, major limitation of of this work is that uh, we haven't found a, a clear way to condition on the environment state. So that, like, if you really place an agent in in a household, for example, there is no, uh, if you want to make coffee, but there is no coffee, uh, but there there's no a, there isn't a automatic coffee machine. How would you make a yeah. coffee with, with some um, maybe simpler devices? Um, so uh, the the agent can't really reason uh, if you just put it this way because it doesn't condition on the environment state. So I think mm -hmm. it would be really interesting to um, like investigate how you can also condition on the current environments and then and then reason from there um mm -hmm. but this might require some training data and uh i think that's part of the reason why we don't like go full length here to investigate this uh because this is something um just for us to um tell people like this is an interesting finding and uh we we may be able to leverage something here um but i think this will be really exciting and and like interesting future work. Cool, excellent. Uh, Wenlong, thank you very much for being here. This was awesome. Uh, so great to hear from, you know, from always from the people who made the stuff. So yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and in the end, I think I also want to like point that like, this is a, a group effort and, and really um, a lot of thanks goes to uh, three of my advisors, um, Peter, Bill, Deepak, Pathak and Igor Mordach. Excellent. All right. Thank you. And Thank you. I hope to see you again. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I, it would be an honor to <laughs> always to, to be here. Yeah. Excellent. All right. All right. Bye bye. Yeah. See you.